Tico, it's a Tico class. Tico, it's a Tico class. Tico, it's a Tico class. Tico Ronga. Yes, it is. Now, as I put that, I really do believe that uh, these were not even destroyer leaders. They were supposed to be destroyers. And they become cruisers due to not even command facilities. But because, honestly, someone needs cruisers. And literally, they look around and go, well, they have Aegis on them and they've got big Aegis. So we're going to call them cruisers. Because we don't have enough cruisers. Because the Russians have more cruisers than us. It's terrible. The Soviet Union's ahead. The tribal class um, would like to have a word with Royal Navy in 1928. If that, what defines a cruiser is wanting it to be a destroyer as a cruiser, is wanting it to be a cruiser. For political ends. They actually acted as cruiser. They did the role of cruisers. The, tico, uh, the Tycos, or as I often call them, the Tycos, have been more or less destroyers. More or less destroyers in all their deployments. They really have been. Let me just check that the sound's on. Yep. Now, I managed to do the, the, the video in 40 minutes. I am aiming to do the common response in 20. Because I need to record so many videos before I go away. I wanted to make at least some 20 minute videos so that, you know, I had the time to record things like the fleet of the Imperium in Warhammer 40k. That is not a short video. I've already done a draft of that video, a draft recording. It's four and a half hours long. Not even I am going to put up the four and a half hour long version. Honestly, the unedited version, the sheer raw data I had, was about six hours long. I'm going to re-record things and try and make it more succinct to the point and more flowy. But I don't see it getting less than two and a half, three hours long. So, in a nice way. And I know there are some people who do watch the full three hour videos. I know. Trust me. YouTube gives me break uh, breakdowns. But I also know the vast majority of people watch the first 45 minutes. And if I can keep something low, below 25, 30 minutes, it gets almost a 90% viewership rate the whole way through. Which is pretty darn cool. But if I record a, a two and a half hour, three hour video, I know that by the end, less than 20% of the viewership will get the whole way through. And I often put some of my coolest bits at the end. If you watch the whole way through videos, I include jokes and questions at the end, which you will never get or understand if you haven't watched the whole video. I put all that effort into a three-hour video and then no one watches the end of it. Well, not no one. The very kind 20% do. You all deserve donuts. The rest who peter out, you merely get butter candy. That's it. Anyway, so um, Quizmaster, I'm trying to go. I'm, try, I'm trying going wide of Darth Digital for a few of my books, but I've had a reasonable success with Amazon. Basically, you want a print version which sells, and your Kindle is free advertising. I'm not spend a, a cent on ads, but do get a views Kindle Limited and sales paperback mostly around twenty percent Kindle books. Hot tubs probably have sharks, maybe. No, sadly enough, they don't. Uh, as I put in a comment response, my experience, the hot tub shark is a corgi, especially if you get in the way of their bubble circuit. And I mean, he literally does a bubble circuit. I will get a video of you, for you at some point of the corgi in a hot tub. Um, I am not quite sure which is funniest when he decides to swim on all four on his normal way around. So he's like this, or when he rolls over on his back and does this in the water. He can't maintain it for long. But it is quite funny, and I just realised I did that camera, so let me just look at myself on it. Yeah, not the worst look I've ever had pictured on the, on this channel. Are you looking to be in the Hamptons Road area? Not soon. Fun preview 2 free. Dr. Clark, could the US Navy use the term the frigate, destroyer leader, because they knew destroyers were so much bigger than their older World War II running mates? 
that were still in service when they decommissioned the Fletchers, Alan Summer, and Gearing classes. Ronnie goes, except the Atlanta class were the original destroyer leader, later redesigned, uh, redesignated CL. Thumper, uh, where does it say that? I know the Atlantis were designed that way, but their uh, size was way too big to be classed anything but CLs. What I mean, their DL hull pennant was going to be used. The Atlantis also fell under the treaty system, which listed destroyer leaders as a t lower tonnage than what the Atlantis were. Yeah, that's the thing. Destro Atlantis were not designed as destroyer leaders. Uh, some current. For what it's worth, I agree. I might have been a catch-all term for ships that were thought to be too large to be called destroyer and too small to be called a cruiser. Yeah. The entry term on Norfolk laid down as CLK-1 in Jane's 1968-69 says, Norfolk was one of two cruiser-sized anti-submarine killer ships authorized in 1948. The size was provide a provide a rough over long-range anti-submarine warfare capability. Construction of the CLK-2 was deferred on 2nd March 1949, cancelled in 1951. Akil was not a land. She was to be named New Haven. Classification. The Norfolk was reclassified as a destroyer leader on 9 February 1951. While under construction, the symbol DL was changed to frigate on 1 January 1955. Entry on the Mischa class in Jane's 1968-69 says, Classification. These ships were originally classified as destroyers. DD 97-9-30, respectively. Reclassified as destroyer leaders. 2-5 to five on 9 February 1951 while under construction. The symbol DL was changed to frigate on 1 1st of January 1955. Mitchell and John S. McCain were classified as DDG-35 and DDG-36 on 15th March 1967. So Mitchell and McCain were gun destroyers, destroyer leaders, frigates, and finally guided missile destroyers. Yeah, the US Navy this time is trying to make our lives more complicated. Strub, the US Navy's issues conning ships with the bridges they have now have makes it hard to see up. Not a good idea. Yeah, you do need... It's a trouble it's making the windows the right size because you don't want too big a windows because then they let in damage. But too small the windows and you can't see out. Michelotes, I remember when the Spruance first came out. Some factors, uh, some factions were giving them stick for being under arm for their size and said complaints got even worse when they built the four DGUV versions for Iran which eventually became the kick class when the USN took them over after the Iranian Revolution. Yeah, they were... They designed as command ships, honestly. You need space. It's one of those things people don't understand. You need space for people. People look at soldiers and soldiers and senders go, well, they're just doing their job. They just need the space to do their job. No, no, they need the space for the person to actually go and sleep. You need the space for the other person who's going to sleep, who's going to do their job when they're asleep. And you need the preferred person as well, because it's probably going to be three of them if you're doing 24 hours a day, because in a nice way, you need the person to be competently well rested and competently well rested and fed, etc. So you probably need about three. You need someone who's a primary on duty, someone who's an alternate to cover when they need to go to the loo or when they need to get food, etc. And all those things. So you've got about three people. So you need their free beds. You need free. Uh, you need space for their clothes. You need a toilet and shower facility. You need food. And then you multiply that across the entire jobs across a ship that you need doing. Oh, and then you have an admiral staff. I need a lot of space. I remember once having a conversation with someone who basically said, well, why don't we just hire a cruise liner to carry on with the battle group? I went, yeah, that's good, but is your cruise liner able to defend itself, or do we need another escort to defend it? Has it got the required subdivision if it gets hit? Has it got the community, secure communications gear? Has it got... And you start going through all the stuff, and you eventually go, oh, fudge. No, it is actually cheaper to just build a slightly bigger warship. Because, relatively speaking, that's what you're doing. When you're building a destroyer which is bigger than... In, uh, you're building a destroyer, you're probably adding on about 500 tons to take an animal stuff. When you're building an aircraft... Oh, they're, they're probably going to come on. When you're building an aircraft carrier, you're probably adding on... <sighs> and please note, these are very much rough figures I've worked out in my own head. Roughly about a thousand tons. Ah, oh, the 1975 ship reclassification. It's so much fun. But, yeah, you're talking about roughly a thousand tons for the, all the staff personnel you're adding on. And then usually someone writes in, well, in the UK, we run it all from Norfolk. No, we don't. We can, in the nicest way, we haven't fought a major war since 1982. And we found out we couldn't, our uh, solo, that we couldn't do it. And that's what caused all the interesting command and control changes to be included in the Invincible class. 
all the various in the, the, the rework to Albion and Bulwark, which if you go on them versus Fearless and Intrepid, they are entire neck new not even next generation, they are entire different species in terms of command facilities. I mean literally on Fearless and Intrepid it was a room a bit bigger than me and my sister's offices. A bit bigger. If you go into the space which is currently assigned on those ships, you will find a command style space which can adequately accommodate 100, 150 people at the same time. If they need to. I would honestly say for many years there is a reason why the Royal Navy was pretty much using Albion and Bulwark as their flagships versus the carriers. Because they actually had the space for a command staff built into them. And the command facilities they actually need. Queen Elizabeth and Prince of Wales are as important as a command platform as they are as a carrier. I know I've talked about this with information perspective, information warfare and naval aviation recently um, in terms of pub in terms of when I'm recording this, not recently in terms of when this comes out. But information warfare and the role in the aviation of that is critical. And sorting out and organizing that information locally, organically to the formation you're with matters. Because they have to make decisions there and then. And they have to make decisions based on the best information they have available at the time. And that's their problem. And that's also why you need the people. Just realising I might not have been even with my shave. I think that one's a bit higher than that one. Apologies. I noticed it in the camera. What? Hang on, people are going to look at me and like, I, I've been wondering what's look, been wrong, slightly wrong with my face all day. And it's literally my shave line. Oh, well, I'll fix it. Sean, um, I feel like you should start a second channel called The Hot Top Historians where you give talks as you soak. That should keep the video short or you'll turn into a prune. I can be in a hot tub for a long time. I might do that from uh, when I'm in a hot tub in Australia. Let's see, Mitchell. Go for a, a swim in North Sea. That wakes you up in the New Year. I did in the 1980s and I'm still alive. <laughs> I have done that. Off the coast of Scotland. Trust me. <laughs> it woke me up and also froze things permanently. Staff Thompson. One of the best parts of these classes has been now. Now I give the numbers are as, as are in public knowledge. Why my D DD and FF have stalled in writing? I need some better clearances. I do believe that the Kevlar is for splinter protection on the vital areas, as you mentioned. They were. And I'm still stuck on the Golden Age of Sail. One of the largest casualty craters of naval combat is shock and splinter. Be it wood, aluminum, or steel damage. And giving a warship an extra bulletproof vest isn't necessarily a bad idea. It's true. Keep up good work. Thank you, and Merry Christmas. A P.S. Why are they going back to the knife edge bow now instead of better but away balancing uh, a piercing bow or more economic X bow? She's going to be a status ship. I mean, honestly, that looks like an FFG, not a DDG, let alone a CCG. There are about a few designs and designs on since that one. It's just constant changing. But Chinooks is better radar cross section, as I understand it. With the conventional bow, you can't achieve good stealth. As mentioned for potential stealth aircraft carried in this interview. X bow might not, what might work, don't know. Hmm. Andrew Reynolds, I think part of the transition to the new bow form is a result of the successful somewhat class hull form. It was the weapons programs that failed, not the platform itself. It's significantly more stealthy for one, as others have mentioned. Hmm. Acerbic Acorn, hello. You can could say the Tico were the first class designed around their PSA phase arrays. All their very early vessels. Trialed fails arrays as options, Long Beach, Big E, but those could be and were removed later on. Tico, without their SPY, and thus part of the Aegis, would have led to their cancellation, most likely. Kevlar would be frag protection, probably against near misses. Bow stern hits and things splashed by the closing weapon system. Yep. Please be hot topped historian. I, I did do some videos, and I'm doing some more videos at some point. That's right. So one could say the Tico is a modernized race uh, as a Spruance class DD. They cut off the superstructure and slapped a new one at its place. Yep. Uh, I might get through this video before it strikes midnight. Thank you, Night Six Eight Three One. B. Shepard, where do you fit the fit the kid class into the TCO evolution? Given that they were not originally intended for the US Navy, they still have to have had some influence on the process. Corsair Six Kid class used a new threat upgrade program, which preceded this Aegis and were used on most of the principal anti-airships in the fleet: CGN, CG Twenty Six, and CG Sixteen. While built on a DD Nine Six Eight hull, they were originally for Iran before the fall of the Shah. Uh, Peter Shepard, thanks for the information. They were a windfall for the USN, nicknamed the uh, Toyola class, and then Taiwan. They are really quite nice ships and really comfortable to go to sea in. 
Nice to, nice to clear everyone. Iran Air Flight 655 is when it was shown at the Tico class computer to human interface failed. There are so many times. Send penguins! Okay, I'm. Uh, this is not a joke. This is a serious one. You need to tell me, send penguins. Is it the feathery kind you want sent, or is it the chocolate kind? You were commenting at Christmas on these ones. I'm presuming the chocolate kind, in which case I need details. Where do you want the chocolate kind sent to you? They're the chocolate biscuits. Penguin biscuits. They are lovely, but where do you want them sent? You're saying send penguins. That's your name. All this about Everything you say is send penguins. I will send penguins if you tell me where to send the chocolate biscuits. I will send them. But mosquitoes have killed more people than any weapon system ever deployed. Swarms of insects are threats. Mm. Speaking about carriers, not being the home of the surface fleet. I think it's informative to consider that often prospective CEOs for the carriers are 056 aviators who haven't held command of a ship before being selected for that position. I'm not saying they hadn't been to sea, nor that they lack organizational experience, just that they were always out of removed from the ship's company when deployed aboard carriers. Sometimes they're stuck going through the new power pipeline as 056 to catch up on the engineering aspects of the ship they're being piloted to pointed towards commanding. That's got a cost terms and solidarity of continuity of community or trusting command from the ship's crew. It's easy enough for command to lose faith of the crew. It's got to be even easier when the com uh, when taking command is under such a handicap. Of course, uh, six. Aircraft carriers are part of US Navy of naval aviation. They are not a part of the surface fleet. The USN, when viewed between ship warfare types, are surface aviation and war submarines. The current doctrine as exists is offensive operations and ship's thinking is done by submarines and aircraft principally. The surface fleet, now without capital ships, has been reduced to fleet defense and escort duty. Amphibious ships are also included in the service fleet. The big depth ships like LHD and LPD are 06 commands, either by service warfare or an aviator. If CO is one, then XO is the other warfare specialty. Surface warfare 06 path take, uh, can take them towards either a command or other amphibious ships, or as a destroyer squadron, de the command, Desron, then onto flag rank. The career path for naval aviator once they reach 05 is command tour of a squadron. Those who get selected for 06 can continue their career path to either ship command, carrier, or remain operational in the aviation community as an air wing commander. Those choosing ship command will go on a crash course at nuke school. Upon completion there, they'll do deep draft ship tour of either an auxiliary ship or an amphibious ship as either CO or XO. Then fulfill an XO billet on a carrier, where they're expected to fleet up to become CO of the carrier. Most carrier captains are in line to become flag, unless they decide on retirement, or they've mucked up. I would agree. However, I would say that potentially... When the system was instituted, it was instituted because you needed to find an accelerated way of getting naval aviators to the top. I would say, and it made sense when there were battleships and major cruisers around that were equivalent for the surface fleet in terms of status. And interesting enough, it also made sense in the nuclear cruiser era because the nuclear cruisers were often used as the large status ships for someone to come out. And again, if you got a nu if you look at the nuclear cruiser captains, for a long period, the officers who got command of the nuclear cruisers were destined for higher rank. And I think that's the problem. I think it's more a problem that the surface fleet now doesn't have a shining beacon to go through. Submarines do. Aviators do in terms of the carriers. But surface captains don't. And surface fleet needs something. They need something for their esprit de corps. Uh, Nick Cole. But send penguins. Seriously, what do you want? Patrick Rato. Tico's have, Ticorongas have aluminium superstructure. They, okay, they don't. They, some of the original ones were designed with it, but also then they had the issues they had of uh, an aluminium structure burning, and so they were redesigned. And so most of the ones you still have still in service do not, as I understand it. And I don't think that is, I don't think that's, uh, I, I don't think that's in any way classified, considering it was being spoken about at an embassy meeting and briefing a long time ago. And there were actual members of the press who then quoted it the next day in the press. And it was said by the ambassador, who I wasn't, who I presume was didn't know much because I, but I did know the U.S. Navy, U.S. Naval Attaché was going. Ah, he got something right. 
and then did that. Basically, he said, let me put it this way. I put it in nicer language than he did about the, the getting something right. And then went, mm, and I went, don't worry, I'm the only one next to you. And I was just giggling away. Don't worry, it's fine. Very cool, Natasha. I have lost contact with him. He was really nice. He was a fun one to chat with. B-1900 pilot. Uh, deployed with one of the early takers. Uh, rail launcher versus VLS. However, I forget the name of the ship. Kitty Hawk BG-1999-93 deployment. Landed on it frequently. Don't recall the quality of the bag now, of the bag now Steve, they handed out when we, uh, we brought them pony. One thing un unique about them is that Tycos have an 06, whereas the Sprucans had an 05 CEO. The CEO of the Tyco and CVG was my, uh, my, of my day was the Air Warfare Commander. Maybe a little one off on some of this data. It was a long time ago. Of course, Air 6 still the same. The Air Flight 3 Burks with the new SPI-V6 radars and large tier C fleet will be billeted for 06 and take over Tyco's role of Air Warfare Commander of CVG. Yep. I know, the Tycos have had to take on the role, but let's be honest, the Tyco is not... It's not the Shining Passage. It's a Tyco, and frankly, everyone knew when they were being built what they were. They were destroyers. They were the Aegis destroyers supposed to back up the strike cruisers. They were supposed to be the, the, the Aegis destroyers to back up the Aegis cruisers, which were going to be nuclear-powered, and then they didn't build the cruisers. So it's kind of the Type 83, Type, uh, type 82, Type 42 scenario again. And the 82 wasn't built. It was only one built. There's no nuclear cruisers built. No nuclear Aegis cruisers built. And so it's a Type 42 which becomes the main destroyer. And it's the Tycos which become the cruiser. B-19 Emperor. I believe the Kevlar Splinter Protection was in the engineering spaces. I would hope there was some in the engineering spaces. As well as the command places, uh, spaces. B9 Emperor, I'm going to go on a limb and ask if you're going to do videos on the Fig, Spru uh, Spruce, and McNara's Folly. Nox was also the last major class of surface warship built. Venus Navy with a very tricky 1200 PSI steam plant. Notorious for always being short of fresh water, too. I deployed on three of them F1105, F1107, and F1073. Rode out a typhoon on one of them. Well, next year, and I'm happy to say this now, will either be the year of the aircraft carrier or the year of the destroyer. And if I do aircraft carriers, it'll be working through aircraft carrier classes like I did cruiser classes. If I do destroyer classes, it'll be working through destroyer classes like I did cruiser classes. Um, and I'll work through them all. And I'll work up to the current day once. Just as I did with the, uh, you know, the US Navy cruisers, I will work up to the current destroyer, current day destroyers. That will be a lot of destroyer classes, so I, I do apologise that some videos might be a bridge. Or rather, there might be a lot of... <clears throat> I think I might need to make them. I might need to make start off the videos at two points, where the Tuesday one will be starting off. If it's a destroyer class, I've worked this out. Destroyer classes, I have to start off in 1890 on the Tuesday videos, and the Friday videos will have to start off in 1945. And I will just about work it through by Christmas. So, uh, that's the question for this video. Because whilst I'm sleeping, I might as well be... Actually, no, I will be awake by this point. It's coming out on the 30th of June. Yay, I'll be awake by this point. So, my sort of, while I am catching up with all the stuff I need to catch up on because I've been away for a month, it'll be really good to hear today's question, whether you'd like next year to be the year of the destroyer or the year of the carrier. I This won't be the final point I make decision, but it will be a case of it'll start leaning me one way or the other in terms of research, and I will make it an actual vote at some point. <clears throat> Myself, I think it can go either way, after the year of technology and the year of cruisers. I think it can go either way. I've got it sort of planned out, I've got, as I've said before, I've got a rough, enough years planned out to get me to 2030. I've got the year of the frigate. I've got the year of well, we've had the year of tech. They're doing the year of technology now. Uh, the year of war, the year of peace, the year of. You can guess what the year of war is. It's all about the big battles, etc., and all sort of a war campaigns and management of wars. You've got the year of peace, which is all about naval diplomacy and presence missions and all those things. 
you've got the year of logistics sort of thing. Uh, the names of the years sometimes change, but the content really doesn't. In terms of, I, I will say, if someone's heard me give these things earlier, there were some earlier draft names and these sort of transitions on them. But you know, I've got roughly another seven years worked out, quite happily. Of which there are four more sort of years, like year of cruiser. So go, there's year of destroyer, there's year of carrier, year of submarines. Guess what the fourth one is? Year of Amphibious and Auxiliary Ships. Um, as we sort of did a year... Uh, what was that? I might do a year of Battleships as well at some point. That, that would be an extra year. That would be an, uh, that would be year number five. Okay, I have that set. And then we have the Year of War, Year of Peace. Mm -hmm. We have the Year of Logistics and Geography. And finally, we have the year history of how naval warfare and maritime warfare has shaped the world. That's probably the most difficult one to do as I'm currently situated. So that one's sort of positioned here. But that's sort of, I've got, so I suppose really I've got about nine years worked out. So I could probably say I've got till 2032 worked out at which point and don't take this wrong way I might start off with a cycle going backwards again and just update it we'll all update all the videos with all the latest research that's come out and all the new books and all the stuff I've done and all the stuff other people have done because that's the thing with academic history and with as I said is I have always with these videos I operate on a policy of I can go back and redo them and I will do if I learn more if if my understanding of history changes because I read a book which has information which I haven't accessed to before and that changes my view on something, I am happy to go back and change my mind. That is the point of being a historian, of being anyone interested in history. It's, I will, I have this opinion as or the based on the information I have now. If in the future I have more information and that changes my perspective on the information I have now, I have currently, and therefore changes the nuance or context or even the entire outcome of my aunt's of my uh, opinion on something, then it's worth. Then it's fine. That's the point. You should learn. That's the point of studying history to learn it, and to occasionally evolve and change your answers. Sometimes you'll be proven right. Sometimes you're proven wrong, and sometimes you're proven not quite right, and sometimes you're not. Pr you're proven not quite wrong. And sometimes it's anything on the spectrum in between. It's fun. So yes, that's all there. Frigates was an option. The frigate one, again, would start off with Age of Sail frigate class. would have Age of Sail frigate classes and World War II frigate classes onwards. And there's also a sixth year, which is the year of the sloops. And small patrol, and patrol vessels. From that to ten years, probably eleven. So yeah, possibly twenty thirty-four. But for that to happen, the channel definitely needs to keep going, and I need to keep growing it as well because, honestly, it it's viable at the moment because I have got just me to support myself to support, and. I'm still living at home at the moment, currently. It was sort of, as I said I've, before I moved, um, I was home for COVID, basically, to look after my mom and sister, because they couldn't be, and I have it's, there are issues, as I've been over before, with people know in videos. Um, my mom is great, but her arthritis has got a lot worse during COVID, her asthma got a lot worse. All these things have piled up, and honestly, what as a family we're looking for is a housing scenario where mum will be able to be on her own, have her own home, but we will have our own homes as well, close enough, sort of on the same sort of plot, 
I think um, my sister's prepared to stay living with my mum, but I would like my own space and, of course, a big enough garden for the doggies to run around and preferably to have more doggies running around. Because we have two at the moment and we like having two. But we <clears throat> probably like to have three or four if we could because we like dogs. It'd be nice. Anyway, but that's uh, that's off the plan. That's the plans, and that's sort of dependent on all of us working very, very hard and getting the house ready, getting the house, so this house sold, finding a new house, moving to it, and getting it set up properly. <sighs> it's all fun. Anyway, Colin Cameron. So, Doc, would it not be more of a 19th century cruiser class? I mean, the Tai Karonga is basically an unprotected cruiser, the strike cruiser being protected in the hours, filling in the armoured cruiser role in the 80s and 90s. Um, they do have Kevlar, let's be honest. Scout cruiser didn't have mu that much, but I have that much protection. Colin Cameron, Kevlar equals coals, great, uh, better than coals protection, equal to or greater than coals. <clears throat> I suppose. Actually, I think the coals probably better. The sheer thickness of the coal for starters. John Hargroves wouldn't like to hit a typhoon in a Tyco with all that sail up top. No, it's not fun. Right, Nathan, Nathan Oaken, I'm going to leave your comment for the end because your comment is massive. It's cool, but it's massive. So I'm going to do other people's comments first. <coughs> Sorry, voice slow down and go. And I've got six, seven more videos to record today. Um, Jesus, uh, Strike Cruiser is too heavy. Too, is heavy cruiser as Tycho's to Dido? Possibly. Mm hmm. Or Atlanta. Uh, Andrew Cox. Of course, Kevlar is a superb material for armoring warship, and its impact absorption capability isn't massively reduced by water absorption. It's okay. Uh, Striking laptop. Um, great content uh, you make, Doctor. Because I say, could you please do a vid on how the waters around the UK are currently patrolled and how often Russian subs and monitors are even engaged? Also, what is Iron's role in this, and what is our future plans with fighter jets? Um, also, would it be an idea for Iron to perhaps purchase two or three or Type 31 so they can contribute a bit more? I would have to plan it out very carefully and check thoroughly what is in the public domain. But if you don't mind waiting a few weeks whilst I do, I might should hopefully be able to produce something to put something together. We also discuss these sort of things on build quite a lot because assist assist each other in avoiding potential mines. We have actually kept those discussions to build pumps. Mainly because of it's easier to uh, and that sort of stuff because that's really current affairs. And we have to be very careful. All three of us have, due to the very nature of various natures of what we do. Various levels of access and information, and we have to be incredibly careful about what or that we use, we dispense. Uh, Corsair Six, for some insight, uh, Port Royal and Century Seventy Three Port Royal ran aground two thousand nine Hawaii after coming out of the yards. Her sonar dome, prop shafts, and part of hull were damaged. After getting fixed and returned to fleet, sailors all know she didn't run very clean. Had a shudder, uh, had a shudder, and was believed to be uh, the grounding had warped, twisted her hull. Not only did she not make her midlife overhaul, the damage that had occurred during the grounding made earlier in time an easy one. Yep. Andrew Reynolds. I knew a few people are bothered by Star Destroyers being labelled as Destroyers, despite acting in a more of a cruiser role. I would say they act more in a battleship role. Let's be honest, Star Destroyers are battleships. They are, they are war-fighting demons. They have their entire air defense, and they have fighter wings, and they have troops they're transporting. They are a capital ship. They are a battleship LHD, and uh, well, battleship LHD rolled into one more than a carrier. Because let's be honest, they're not. They don't. Let's be honest, they don't carry enough fighters to really qualify. You see, the thing is, the Vindicators they they could be argued to be a battleship carrier, and a bit of a, a bit of a battleship carrier and LP and landing platform dock, but star the star destroyers are more battleship slash LHD. And smaller ships and labels, cruisers or frigates, all sorts of things. But I think it's fine, partly because of how the terms and roles are generally shifting now. Destroyers are now taking up the cruiser role in the oceans and have done so for an of the frigates. And it's basically any escort these days is doing the cruiser role because they don't have anything else to do to do cruiser role and that's what you need to do in peacetime. Despite the Tom Crown class being called cruisers, there's not any laws against changing terminology, not as long as it's still easily understood. Just convention. 
Yeah, but purists, and frankly, I would like it to make sense. It's not convention that worries me, it's making it logical sense. Now, to Nathan! Oaken. Lovely. Right then. Now, I think you have discussed all this before in... Because you're talking about... You're giving me the comments about the beam riding missiles. Main problems with missiles proximity fuse we set off by ocean when the missile got low enough to be able to approach the enemy. Yeah, this is a very cool comment. And I recommend people go read it. But it's very similar to your comment you did on... I think it was US nuclear-powered cruisers, or was it, uh, which I read out in full. So I will read this again, but I will give you an abridged answer rather than the full one, because... You gave such a full, so you gave pretty much the same one on the nuclear power cruise, and I gave a full answer on that one. So, if anyone wants to hear a longer answer, please note it's in New US nuclear powered cruisers, common response. Note, a note. All of the large AA guided missiles used by US Navy, Tata, Terrier, Talas, and Aegis, have their missiles mm, with an anti surface ship capability. Not counting Talas and Terrors, beam riding missile nukes, primary for sure target, target attack. Ouch. Due to the homing versions, all Tartar and Aegis and the later Terrian missiles need a semi-active guidance system. That is requiring continuous line of sight control from neutral beam riding te technology. Only Talos and Terrian missiles and for the X-band ship ra radar target illumination from the ship. Except for the few of uh, new fully active homing SM6 ranges, I would think. Requiring line of sight to the target for tracking illumination. The range for anti-surface attack is rather short because of the horizon limited view. This is obviously not a major a major mode for weapons. It is still a dangerous threat to any ship that gets close enough to any of these that is uh, these missile equipped ships for radar tracking. With the Talos and original Terrier beam riding missiles, the main problem was that the missile's proximity fuse would be set off by the ocean when the missile got low enough to approach the enemy ship. This also occurred with the earlier Tartar and Terrier homing missiles. Since Telos had a separate guidance control beam antenna for its missile from the huge radar tracking antenna, the missile could be shifted deeply downwards near the target and prevent the proximity fuse from going off until the missile was just above the target and form a shotgun blast of fragments against the target's deck. The huge size of the Talos meant that the target would receive lots of fragments, and since the short range was so short, lots of burning missile ramjet fuel, and the hit would be rather catastrophic. Terrier had only a single combined tracking beam radar uh, control radar, so this was not possible. With the homing missile, the same problem occurred with the ocean surface on the proximity fuse, so they also did not work well against surface targets. What was done for Tartar and Terrier was introduce modified missiles of both Tartar and improved Tartar on it, or IT and Terrier, homing tail controlled retrofit of HDR, that had a special surface target selection that caused a proximity fuse to be turned off and the missile trajectory to be changed to a steep up and down path that, like Talos, would cause the damage, here from a direct hit or very close miss, a mix, a miss by the blast of the warheads, uh, warhead set off by the impact fuse. To be considerable... These homing missiles were much faster than Talos even back then, and kept getting faster and faster as time went on. Since the Tartar and Terry missiles were 12 inch in diameter, 30.5 centimeters in diameter, and weighed about 1,500 pounds, uh, 680 kilograms, and at close range still had a lot of solid f uh, rocket fuel remaining. On top of their admittedly small, ra small rather small, against the Soviet warhead, they were moving at 1,000 ma miles an hour, and they would punch rather a deep hit, ra ringed by a huge number of steel mi missile fragments and lots of burning material into their target, from a direct hit or lots of fragments and burning material from a near miss, as well as a torpedo warhead-like underwater concussion against the ship hull when close enough. Even a battleship would suffer considerable damage near the impact point of the or a near ship from these missiles. Mm, near impact I'm not so sure about it would be more of a shock damage so it wouldn't be sort of structure it, it wouldn't be so much structural damage but you would get shock damage I think I think that's more likely with a battleship if it's a proper battleship i.e. has actual belt armor there were some built which were interesting Later to, further improve, later to further improve the ability to get damage from near miss, an improved surface mode selection proximity fuse was developed that could tell the ocean surface from a ship, hull, and a superstructure, vertical reflections versus horizontal reflections, and wider near misses could now in inflict considerable blast and fragment damage against unarmored targets, especially small ships. Indeed, within the limited range of the target due to the need for surface ship guns all the way, these AA missiles could be just as dangerous as any of the larger anti-ship cruise missiles. I assume the Aegis has the same capability as Tartar and Terrier SM1 and SM2 missiles had in surface mode. I wouldn't be surprised if they do. 
And now, once again, the comment response video is longer than the actual video was. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed, and um, take care. As I said, this comes out on the 30th of June. Hope you had a nice June, and hope you enjoyed the Australian content. Toodles. Thank you for watching.